This is the last part of the unit on structures of simple solids, where we're going to look specifically at the electronic structure of solids. So uh, what we have is we're going to use the molecular orbital approach to try and understand what is happening um, in solids and the movement of electrons and why metals conduct electricity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we know from our bonding unit that molecular orbitals are formed from atomic orbitals. Um, the number of atomic orbitals is going to give you the same number of molecular orbitals. In solids, this number is very large. Okay, so if the atoms were in a one-dimensional row, we're going to see that the bonding orbitals are going to have no nodes. All right, so um, the antibonding orbitals will correspondingly have n minus one nodes. So if there's, there are three antibonding orbitals, then we're going to have two nodes in between those antibonding orbitals. And in three dimensions, the nodal structure becomes very much more complex, but it's really just an extension on the one-dimensional structure. So what you see on the right-hand side here, for energy level n equals 1, and we're looking at maybe an s, orbi uh, an s orbital, a sigma orbital, sorry, if it's a molecular orbital, we have uh, 1, and then there are Two, two atomic orbitals that give us two um, molecular orbitals, three atomic orbitals to give us three uh, molecular orbitals, four atomic orbitals to four, and this one at the bottom here is really showing uh, a band. Okay, so what you see is many, many, many energy levels, and you see this band of molecular orbitals. Okay, so let's give an example where we are going to show you the stepwise development of the metallic state using the molecular orbital argument or the theory um, with lithium. So let's start with diagram A on the left here. Okay, so what we have is we have the, um, on the outside, this is a molecular orbital diagram of lithium. Uh, remember it has uh, three electrons um, and this is the uh, valence um, portion of the molecular orbitals, looking at the 2s electron, where we've got one electron in each. And when we form the molecular orbital, the two electrons go into the sigma orbital, and this becomes lithium-2. Now, what if I was to take three lithium atoms, okay, um, on actually six lithium atoms, because now I want to form lithium-6. Okay, so I've got three lithium atoms on the left, three lithium atoms on the right, each of them having uh, one 2s electron each. Combining them all together, you see now we put all the 2s orbitals together, and we put the sigma orbitals and the sigma star orbitals uh, together in lines. We stack them, and you see that we then have the three electrons from here, and the three electrons from here, giving us six electrons into those bonding orbitals. All right, let's go one further. Okay, so that was diagram B. Let's have a look at diagram C. Okay, now we're going to make a lithium that has 10 atoms. So that means I'm going to take five lithium atoms and combine them with five lithium atoms. I'm going to stack the two S orbitals um, and the electrons together so that I have there's five on this side, and there's five on this side, and they'll end up being 10 in the uh, sigma bonding orbitals. All right, so now let's go to diagram D. Now we want to look at a nanoparticle. A nanoparticle contains loads of molecular orbitals and atomic orbitals. So we're not showing the atomic orbitals here. We're simply showing that there is a, if we had to stack, as we've been stacking the molecular orbital here, we now stack the molecular orbital here and we end up giving this, this band okay, of uh, um, molecular orbitals, sig sigma molecular orbitals that are full of electrons. And then here we end up with this band of sigma star orbitals that are empty. Okay? And finally, if we look at diagram E, we see that this is for lithium metal and we have a similar thing now, but have a look is that the the um, the sigma molecular orbitals are almost of the same uh, have reached 
the capacity here, um, if I just if I just draw it here like this, where they're almost touching one another, there's no gap between them at all. So that means that we can have um, electrons that can be promoted up or down. Okay, so this is for lithium metal, and you see now we have bands of orbitals. As I've explained, just shows you that there's a band, and in this case, you'll see that there's a gap. Okay, this is for a nanoparticle, so there's a bit of a gap. We call that the band gap. I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. And of course, this is now the band where electrons can move. All right, so when there's an overlap of a very large number of atomic orbitals in solids, this leads to a very large number of molecular orbitals and gives rise to these bands of energy levels that are separated by energy gaps. The bands can be separated by band gaps, which are values of the energy for which there is no molecular orbital. So the diagrams show you um, exactly what I've just explained. So let me use this one as an example here, where we've got all of these filled um, molecular orbitals, and then the antibonding orbitals at the top is empty, and we can allow for some promotion. And of course, there's a gap here. This is a gap, all right? And we call this a band gap. Um, and it depends, in, in this instance here, in this diagram here, we have two different band gaps depending on the number, on the types of orbitals that we have. All right, so a band can be described as something that's formed by bringing up atoms successively to form a line of atoms where the number of atomic orbitals gives us the exact same number of molecular orbitals. So in the first diagram at the bottom here, we see that we've got uh, these bands of bonding orbitals. Then we have some intermediate bonding orbitals where uh, you, you start to notice uh, the, the, the change from uh, uh, bonding to antibonding. And then here we have at the top, we have the um, most antibonding, which are obviously higher in energy. The middle diagram explains this quite well. And why you see these gaps is that you've got loads and loads of uh, bonding molecular orbitals. And over here, you've got loads and loads of antibonding molecular orbitals. And suddenly you end up from a zero energy, you end up with this with this uh, gap that happens over here, okay. This is just another representation using specifically the S and P bands of different orbitals. So we have S atomic orbitals, um, and there's some separation in the atoms. And then we have an S band where we've got the, the bonding molecular orbitals here. So this is bonding orbitals. These are antibonding orbitals. Um, and here again, we have the P orbitals, where these are bonding orbitals, and these are antibonding orbitals. And you find that we've got this there's, there's this, there's this gap between the orbital, which is represented here, like that, and that is the band gap in the solid. It, it looks something like this. And in some instances, you actually have the overlap of the S and P bands. Um, which you would, we've already explained how we get S and P mixing where the orbitals uh, switch over with one another. It's particularly pre prevalent in period two uh, elements up to and including nitrogen. Okay, so in some instances, we also get overlap of D orbitals. So with titanium dioxide, it has a rock salt structure you'll see that these are the d orbitals. Now, remember, I told you right back at the beginning of Unit 1, when we did atomic theory, that you were to know uh, the shapes of the d and, well, most specifically, the d orbitals. Now, the, this, this, is, this you can see is a d orbital. Okay, um, I'll draw it for you. And I'll just outline it so that you can see. And here, these are for titanium atoms. The purple atoms are the titanium atoms. And you can see here is where the overlap takes place. Okay, so that's how we've got this overlap. Um, and it, 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 this is quite a complex thing. I'm not going to go into too much more detail uh, about d orbital overlap, but this is how the d orbitals will overlap in this particular structure. Okay, because of the large number of atoms and atomic orbitals, the result is bands of molecular orbitals with similar energies. 
So the highest energy band is called the valence band. The next empty band is called the conductance band. And the energy difference in the bands, so the energy difference between the valence band and the conductance band is called the band gap. Now, obviously, we know that metals can be conductive, semiconductive, or insulative. And so this slide just gives you some definitions. I'll leave you some time to read through what the definitions are for conductors, semiconductors, insulators, and even superconductors. All right, one thing I do want to point out is there's a certain level uh, in metals which we call the Fermi level. The Fermi level is the highest occupied molecular orbital for metals. Um, I'm not, yeah. So in, in this case, where we've got occupied levels, the, 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 highest, the highest occupied molecular orbital, this would be the Fermi level here. And in this case, that's, that's for a metal, but for an insulator, uh, you find that the Fermi level is slightly higher up. Okay. Um, if the gap is too big and the valence bands are filled, then the material is classified as an insulator. So what I'm showing you on the right-hand side here in these diagrams here, these are called density of state diagrams. Okay, so in this case, we've got a full valence band. So here the valence band is full and the conductance band is empty. And the Fermi level is here. So we have some uh, molecular orbitals that are occupied up here. You can see that this gap is quite big and therefore the promotion of electrons between the uh, valence band and the conductance band has to overcome a large amount of energy through the Fermi level and hence the material be classified as an insulator because for these electrons to jump that gap is going to be uh, energy intensive. Okay, if the gap is small enough and the valence band is only half filled, okay, then the electrons are free to move and leave holes behind, giving us electron va vacancies and the material is said to be a conductor. So in this case, at the top here, we have an insulator and at the bottom here, on this side, we have a conductor. Simply because the Fermi level, remember, is the highest occupied molecular orbital. It may be half filled, in which case we can get promotion of electrons um, where you start to see con uh, conduction taking place. Okay, we get semiconductors. These are insulators at low temperature. They have increasing conductance with increasing temperature. So the flow of electrons can be controlled by an applied voltage. Um, we have something called intrinsic semiconductors. Uh, here the band gap is really small that the thermal energy allows the electrons to be promoted to the next band. Um, examples of, of these semiconductors are silicon and germanium. And you can see in the picture on the right hand side that we have an almost full valence band um, and with temperature we're able to promote the electrons uh, up to the conductance band. We also have doped semiconductors. These are extrinsic semiconductors, which means that we can have a non-semiconducting material with a small amount of another element that is added on purpose. Uh, there are two types. One is called a p-type semiconductor, which is a solid dope with atoms that are that will remove electrons from the valence band. Okay, so in the picture, this one here will be a p-type semiconductor. And then we have an N-type semiconductor, where, which is a solid dope with atoms that add electrons to the valence band. Um, and so then we'll get something here called an N-type semiconductor. 